God bless your name for this pastor's conference. We thank you because of the things you've been teaching us. Father, we pray that these words you have spoken to us from your word will become part of our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that you will lead us this morning into your word again. And bless us mightily. In Jesus' name we pray. From Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. We read of the call of Jesus Christ to his own disciples and the purpose of that call. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 19. And he says unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And then in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. In Second Peter chapter 3, Second Peter chapter 3, Verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as men count slackness, but is long suffering towards word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This morning we want to consider the ministry that God has given to every pastor, every evangelist, and teacher in the church. In God's own divine economy, he has so planned that men and women who are lost in sin, degradation, and darkness will hear the gospel from mortal men like themselves with the difference that these mortal men have been saved, turned unto the Lord, brought into the kingdom of God, but that the rest of humanity, lost in sin, will hear the gospel of deliverance and salvation from men like themselves and unlike themselves. So those of us who have been saved, in one way, we're like the rest of humanity because we're human, because we're men and women like they are, but unlike them because we have been saved. And we have assurance within us that Jesus is our Savior. And this divine economy that has made the Lord to choose us as instrument in his hand has also planned that the people we reach will be reached through the preaching of the gospel. But then in the preaching of the gospel, there is the demonstration, one, of the power of God, two, of the wisdom of God. So then it means in reaching out to the lost, we are concerned with getting the message across, but then we're concerned with the miracles. We're concerned with the methods. The message will preach that. The miracles that demonstrates the power of God. The methods, the wisdom of God. But then we need to realize how the work is actually done. How the lost is won. How sinners are saved. Because if we do not understand what's major, what's central, the message 
or the miracle, the miracle or the method, will get mixed up and the work we ought to do will not be done. That's why <coughs> we titled the message, The Hook and the Bait. Jesus Christ himself told the disciples, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. In Matthew chapter 17, the first part of verse 27, notwithstanding, lest we should offend them. Go thou to the sea, and cast an hook, and take up the fish that first cometh up. When Jesus saw the disciples by the seaside, and they were catching fish, he then related their life career of winning souls with fishing. One of the methods those fishermen used before Jesus met them was to cast hooks into the sea or into the river to catch the fish. And since Jesus said he'll make them fishers of men, obviously they must be casting hooks into the sea of humanity so as to catch fish with human hearts, with human eyes, with human mind, with human destiny. And from what Jesus Christ himself had said, saying, I will make you fishers of men, we then need to think about fishing and see how that relates with the work we do as preachers of the gospel. Sure enough, it's not only hooks that are used, nets were also used. Now, you will see that in the ordinary fishing, Peter, as one of the disciples and one of the fishermen, was experienced in the use of the hook. And he never forgot it. The Lord told him, take the hook, cast into the sea, take up the fish. For a purpose at that time, after Jesus had risen from the dead, and the disciples were still confused as to what were they to do now? Fierce within, fierce without. The Jews terrifying them and their own thoughts too, harassing them. They didn't know what to do. That they took their nets to fish. So that you will see that those disciples were not ignorant of any method of catching fish. And in the same way, we who are here today, and they were there that time, they were not ignorant, and we must not be ignorant, of the approaches in different seas and different rivers, in catching the fish in those different river communities. They used the net, they used the hook. But let's come back to the illustration of the hook. When you are fishing, you do not throw the hook into the river just bare, without something in it. Because the hook itself has no attraction for the fish. The hook is the central thing, is the main thing. Is the thing that will draw out the fish from the river into your boat and eventually into the market to fulfill the desire of the fisherman. But the hook itself, even though it's central, essential, important, indispensable, very necessary for the fisherman, has no attraction to the fish. Not only that, the fish have never been caught by the hook. So they do not have a feeling of what the hook is all about. They might have seen the hook before in the river 
without seeing a fisherman, and they might have swum through, uh, swum through uh, that place without getting at the hook because it had no attraction for them. So they might be aware of the existence of the hook, but as to the importance and the purpose, they might not know. Now, if they even knew the purpose, that will still be negative for the fisherman because then they will avoid the hook. So a reasonable fisherman and even an unreasonable fisherman knows that you do not cast the hook into the river without anything in it. That's what brings in the bait. That the fisherman will put the bait in the hook. And as he puts the bait in the hook, the fish will be reaching for the bait, not reaching for the hook. Reaching for the bait, but in an attempt to get the bait, he gets the hook. Is that right? But then, how do you uh, attach the hook and the bait? One, if you had a hook and you had a bait for the purpose of illustration, and you threw the hook separately into the river, the bait separately into the river, you'll never catch anything. The fish will eat up the bait and avoid the hook because they are separated. And in the preaching of the gospel, you'll soon find out the hook is the message. It has convicting power. It pricks the heart. It condemns sin in the heart. It is not convenient for the sinner, and yet it is the central major thing that gets the sinner out of the sea of humanity and brings him separated from every person, everybody else, to bring him into the net, the net of the kingdom, the kingdom of God. But then, just like the hook has no attraction, ordinarily to the fish the message of repentance that people may come to the Lord and be converted the message has no attraction for the sinner it condemns him it convicts him in fact it repels him ordinarily without the drawing power of the Holy Spirit he will not appreciate being hooked with that message. But then, what's the bait? Let's come back to fishing before we go into the application as to the bait. If you have read books on fishing, and I think you should, because of the relationship between the work that a preacher does and the work that the fisherman does. You would have understood that the ordinary fishermen who do not study anything at all, they do not study whether by observation or by reading, going to school, or just by learning from other experienced fishermen before them. They just go to the riverside, they know that you use the hook, you use the bait. Now, if they do not learn anything at all, it will take them a long time to really catch. I don't know whether you saw the picture recently in one of our dailies, I think it must have been last week, that in Osage Sokoto State or so, they had this fishing festival. Is that, is that Sokoto State? And... Um, they wanted to see who will catch the biggest um, catch. And this um, individual caught a fish 80 kilograms in weight. Another person, I think, uh, 45 kilograms in weight. Another, a little bit above 50 kilograms in weight. Obviously, those people must begin, must have realized that they were looking for a big catch 
and therefore they were not going to use a small sized hook because the hook must be strong enough big enough to be able to pull that big fish out of the river now those fishermen must be experienced then obviously they must have known and studied that in that vicinity in that river the type of bait that a small fish of one kilogram will eat is not the type of bait that an 80 kilogram fish will desire or want to eat they must have studied the peculiarities of the fish in those rivers to now go with the appropriate hook of good size of good weight then to go with the appropriate bait without study they would not have been able to do what they did and even in the use of the nets as well there must be some study on the peculiarities of the fish in that river for you to be able to catch appropriately now when you apply that to fishing that might begin to show you that in the preaching of the gospel if we're preaching with God's own purpose in mind that sinners will be saved that people will be reached we must choose the hook and choose the bait but as I've said before no matter how good the bait might be if the bait is thrown into the river without the hook or there is no good link solid link between the bait and the hook then we're not going to catch anything at all i've said the hook represents the word of god the preaching of the gospel the bait represents the other things that we do along with the preaching of the word of god that acts as a bait to the fish to the people of the world in bringing them to the lord jesus christ what are those things the ordinary pentecostal will say the working of miracles alone but it is not in every case that the working of miracles attracts every person into the christian faith now you will know i said it yesterday when i was preaching on men mountains and miracles that last week in emo stage this indian uh, that came and i prayed for her when the miracle took place <coughs> excuse me she came back and she asked me is it magic now that will reveal something to you if in a community there have been magicians there that will play some tricks and then you come in ignorant of the situation in that community and all you do is just to say well i'll show these people blind eyes will see lame legs will be strengthened and they'll start to walk the deaf will hear all those who have been familiar with magic might just take what you are doing as magic and then it does not actually act as a bait in that community until there is proper education as to what is it you are doing now healing the sick will be a bait for those who are sick but not for those who are well answers to prayers for children or teenagers that are incorrigible will be a bait to parents that have children that are incorrigible but not to children not to parents that do not have such children now if 
people recognize that they are being tormented of evil spirits and they have the spirit of insanity and um, the family that has been laboring for that individual because they love him now that family will count it it will be a bait for them if the precious person in that family that is having the mental problem is cured by the miraculous power of God. That might be a bait for them. But take the other case that there is an individual that before he became mentally insane, he had been notorious. He had been very, very bad and the family had rejected him. And after the rejection, he started going about the streets a menace and a mentally insane individual violent and the family had rejected him before that time so they didn't even look for him to get him to the hospital eventually you are preaching somewhere and then he gets healed he goes back to the house they still reject him they say the problem is not just that you are mental you have been notorious we do not want to have anything to you to do with you as a family in that case the cure of that man is not necessarily a bait for the family that had rejected him so then that means as we get to the rivers the different communities we study and we see what is the bait that will be attached to the hook that will catch all these people now let's even settle that in the majority of the communities the bait is miracle the opening of the eyes of the blind the lame walking and a lot of things that might happen in the miraculous sense I've told you that if you cast out the bait without the hook the fish will eat up the whole bait without ever getting converted without ever coming to know the Lord and there are people that are interested in just praying for the sake interested in just delivering the oppressed interested in just having this done and that done and yet the church is not increasing and they are wondering why that we are experiencing as much miracles as you experience in another state where the church is growing and yet in the church here though there are many many miracles and testimonies have been given the people have really not been giving their lives to the lord because the bait had been given out separately and at a separate time the hook is also thrown out into the river a lot of bait a good hook but thrown out at different times and because there is no proper link the people are not converted they are not drawn to the lord we must remember that our purpose is not just praying for the sick, healing the sick, delivering the oppressed. Our purpose is to get souls saved. In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost the son of man was come to seek and to save that which was lost it's true that jesus performed miracles but then there was a purpose behind those miracles the sick were healed many things did happen but then the purpose behind it all is the salvation of the multitudes of sinners living at that time and Jesus has sent us out with the message one so that people will be saved 
and two after they are saved they'll be integrated with the body of Christ let's examine our own situations in the church if you have been keeping records of the people we call newcomers and you will look through at the end of the year and say from January through to February to March until December how many new people had passed through our church for the purpose of illustration let's just use a statistics like this that if your church at present has an attendance of 500 that it is likely when you look through the whole year you might have seen through the cards given to the newcomers to feel you might have got about 2,000 newcomers throughout the whole year does that statistics uh, agree with uh, most of our churches that if for example you have about 200 in the church that you might discover at the end of the year from December uh, from January to December that the number of newcomers that have passed through the church might have been up to 800 is that a uh, true of our churches and um, yet at the end of the year if you started with 500 and 2,000 had passed through the church as newcomers, you might not be more than 600 at the end of the year, which means out of the 2,000 that passed through, you are able to retain just about 100. Why did they come to start with? What drew them to start with? It's the bait. Now, the bait take miracles as bait. The miracles draw people together. But then it is the hook that will catch them. After they have come through the bait, the hook will catch them and bring them into the boat, into the kingdom. In Bible days, miracles drew people. The miracles did not convert them. The miracles did not keep them with the church. The miracles did not make them to say, now Jesus Christ is going to be our Savior. And we're going to stay in the church, in the kingdom of God, till the rest of our lives. For the rest of our lives, till the end of our lives. It was just to draw them that the miracles had power to do originally then the message got them saved in acts of the apostles chapter 3 acts chapter 3 verse 11 and as the lame which was healed held peter and john all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though? By our own power of our holiness, we had made this man to walk. The God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his son Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. Now, you'll see the link between the bait and the hook. You'll see the link between the miracle and the message. 
a great manifestation of God's power are taking place. This man that had been lame from birth, now 40 years of age, had been raised up by the mighty power of God. That drew the people together. That's why it's bait. But then all they did was to wonder, not to believe. And as they wondered, Peter said, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? And then he continued. What could he have said? There are two alternatives. Could have exalted Jesus Christ like he did. Two. The other alternative, he could have exalted himself. Now when I say exalt, he could have exalted himself with a good purpose in mind, so to say. What's the good purpose that he could have in mind if he did not know the divine purpose, the ultimate goal, and the necessity of using the hook and the bait to get them into the kingdom of God, he could have exalted himself in this way, that God had raised him up with the other apostles so that they will give to the people the needs of the people and meet the needs of the people more than the Pharisees could meet the needs of the people. And so with that purpose in mind, which will appear genuine, which will appear acceptable, that you wanted to divert their minds away from the synagogue to this church, to this place now where God had raised them up as apostles, he could have said, now this is to show you, you've been going to the synagogue, to the temple for a long time, and nothing like this happened. But God has raised us apostles up. Now if he did that, the people will believe. That is, they will believe that God had raised them up. Like he raised up Moses or Elijah. But they would have believed he has raised up another prophet like the prophets of Israel. The main issue, the main message of Jesus Christ being the Son of God, being the Messiah, being Christ, will be toned down. Because you cannot exalt Christ and Peter at the same time. You may do that later, but when you are doing it for Peter, what the people will understand at that material moment is for Peter. Maybe another time, if you get the opportunity to do it for Christ, you'll do it for Christ. But then the consequence is this, that the miracles are not just exalting Christ, making them to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The preachers are doing a lot so that the attention of the people will be on Christ and the preacher, the preacher and Christ. And that will not act as the real bait in the hook to get them very quickly into the kingdom of God. But Peter chose the better way. And he held on to the better way until the end of his life and ministry. Like what God, what Jesus said about Mary, she has chosen that good thing that shall not be taken away from her. He chose the better way. And immediately they all came together because the miracle had acted as a bait, pulling them together. He began to say, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Why look ye so intently on us? As they were looking intently on them, he didn't start a praise worship. You know, in some of our congregations, if a miracle like this took place, we'll start a praise worship. And there will be no time 
to preach the real gospel. Salvation message will be missing, will be carried away, will forget it's only a bait, and the hook is still missing, and the people are not being caught into the kingdom of God. But Peter immediately seized on the opportunity. You're looking on us as if by our power of holiness we've made this man to walk. The God of Abraham. The God of Isaac. And of Jacob. As glorified, he didn't say, as healed this man. As glorified his son Jesus. He was in a hurry to get to his destination. In a hurry to get to the hook. And to show them that what they were talking about was salvation in Christ Jesus. Who they were talking about was the very son of God. That thing that they rejected. That Jesus will call himself the son of God. He emphasized it at this opportunity. Whom ye delivered up and denied him before in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But she denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God has raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses something is very significant here or perhaps some things it was an extemporaneous message what that means is that a message that was not planned before they were going to the temple if you read the whole story before from verse 1 at the hour of prayer they did not premeditate that this might happen, they will preach this message. But then they saw that lame man minister to him. He got well. The people drew together. And then Peter started to give out this message. That's significant. Many of us. After years of professing that we have the Holy Ghost, we cannot give a message like this that will be coherent, compact, not drawn out, and will be conclusive and nail the thing on the head. When these people had the Holy Ghost, they heard the Holy Ghost, not just to make them speak in tongues, but to equip them to do the work they ought to do. But in our circles today, our profession of having the Holy Ghost does not teach us how to preach, how to get the message across, direct, sensible, presented in a wise way and catching, catching the people. If we were cornered up, we would ramble. That is, if we have to preach by force, that the situation demanded we must preach. Because all we have known is just that when the Holy Ghost comes, he makes you to speak in tongues, you have a prayer language, and you are able to, you know, worship the Lord in spirit, because that is what we know about the Holy Spirit. We do not understand and we do not know this major area, major, foundational, of the Spirit of God, helping us to be able to talk to the people straight, the real death of the word of God. We do not have that. But Peter just opened his mouth. And he started with Abraham. And in that same verse, he had landed on Jesus Christ. It will take us a long time. Though we say we are baptized in the Holy Ghost. 
And sometimes you'll wonder how foolish we are sometimes, maybe even many times, when we give answers to questions at the time of search the scripture in our churches. Or when people confront us, we do not have any Bible verse. Generally, some people, some of our pastors will say, Oh, I could have said this. That's after the opportunity is passed. But Jesus said that when the Holy Ghost has come, He will teach you what to say. That the Spirit of your Father in you will speak through you. Why do we waste all our time speaking in tongues? And yet, when the real need comes, we fail. We do not have the word. We cannot put across the word of the living God. And um, I have emphasized this everywhere I have gone. Because when you look at the New Testament, look at the Acts of the Apostles, you don't find just speaking in tongues, speaking in tongues, speaking in tongues, speaking in tongues, because you have got the Holy Ghost baptism. What you find is a multiplicity of the fulfillment of the office of the Holy Ghost in the lives of the apostles and those prophets and the people of God in the Acts of the Apostles. When a miracle was needed, the Holy Ghost was there to perform it through them. When boldness was needed, the Holy Ghost was there to make them bold in that situation. When they needed the word of God to reach out in a powerful, pungent way, the Holy Ghost was there to get it across to the people through them. And whatever it was, even when wisdom was needed, you'll find the Holy Ghost was there to get it across to the people. And we must come back to the Bible. I was um, preaching to some leaders in London, talking about vision for growth. And I was telling them that what makes a church to grow, talked about the pastor, talked about the people, talked about praying, and then I talked about preaching. And I told them, the preaching that will get the people, one, must be positive. It's not just, uh, you know, reading the word of God haphazardly. It must be positively directed to the needs of the people. Not only that, it must be practical. Then one of the points I said, it must be Pentecostal preaching. But then I told them, wait a minute. What I meant by Pentecostal preaching, I didn't mean jumping up, shouting, and screaming. And that's not Pentecostal preaching. And it is not all these things we have put into what we call Pentecost. That's not it. But the type of preaching that comes out direct in the wisdom of God and reaches straight to the people's hearts and pricks them. And he'll say, men and brethren, what shall we do to be saved? That's Pentecostal preaching. And we in this church, we must balance up everything. Now you can see Peter here. He spoke the word. Very, very coherent. Very, very logical. And you'll see how he developed the points. And then you will see how he talked about the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if they're going to be saved, if they're going to come to the Lord, he must present to them Jesus the Savior, the Son of God. And he said, you denied him, the Holy One, the just. And you desired the murderer to be granted unto you. You killed the Prince of Life. Now, have you seen in Peter's message, you delivered up the Son of God and you denied him. You know what he's saying? God accepted him, acknowledged him. The opposite is what you did. You denied him. You say you are children of Abraham, children of God. You are not like God. Can you see the message? Then, you denied the Holy One, the just, and you desired the undesirable, the murderer. You should have desired the Holy One. 
if you were really the holy people of God, this holy one and the just that came should have been desirable to you. But you desired the murderer. You killed the prince of life. Can you see the link? The prince of life, the one that has life. The one that is a giver of life. That one you killed is making use of those opposites. And he didn't prepare an outline. They didn't tell him three weeks before time you are going to preach a message. But that's the fulfillment of the promise God, Jesus Christ gave them. That do not premeditate what you are going to say. At the moment, at the hour, the Holy Ghost will give you the words you are going to speak. You killed the prince of life. But then, for God showed you that he is not in agreement with what you did. He reversed what you did. He raised him up. You are not of God. You are not following God. Because God is contradicting and opposing what you are doing. And the things that are desirable, you do not desire them. So you can see, you are just saying that you are children of Abraham, but you are not. And then he says, God has raised him from the dead. Whereof we are witnesses, and his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, you know, we have, we, maybe you have been taught before, we've repeated it before, that when you preach a message, there is introduction, there is the body of the message, there is the conclusion. And look at Peter. The Holy Ghost doesn't make you disorganized. You know, there are people that will credit disorganization to the Holy Ghost. And the message they preach, there is no beginning as such. There is no body. There is no structure. There is no climax. There is no conclusion. Ramble. They go here and there. You know, they talk about this. They talk about this. And uh, eventually, when the state leader calls them and says, My brother, look at this message you have preached. No organization. No coherence. Nothing at all. And you didn't even come to a conclusion. To get the people to decision. What have you done? Well, I prayed a lot. And as I was talking, the things were just coming out like rivers of living water. <laughs> and it's the Holy Ghost. The sin he has committed is the Holy Ghost that committed it. The mistake he has made is the Holy Ghost that made it. But the Holy Ghost does not make a person disorganized, incoherent. Look at um, Peter. The introduction, the God of Abraham. That God, they wanted to listen. Then the body of the message is about Jesus Christ. The conclusion, now brethren, I know that through ignorance ye did it as also your rulers. I know you were ignorant about it. You didn't know. But those things which God before assured by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer. He has so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore. Can you see how many verses there were? Not three hours. And yet he got to the point. Repent ye therefore. Come back to what we were saying before. The miracle, the bait. The message of repentance, the hook. The message had, the miracle had been given. The miracle had been performed. Now that acted as bait and drew the people. Now the message of repentance. And believing on Jesus Christ. So that they can be saved. Verse 26. Unto you first, God having raised up his son Jesus, has sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Very, very clear. Very, very clear. And then in chapter 4, verse 4. How be it? Many of them which had the word believed. And the number of the men was about 5,000. Now you have seen the miracle drawing the people as a bait. 
and then the message following after as the hook. But it's not always in that order. Because this is spiritual and it has something above and beyond the physical, the natural. The hook and the bait or the bait and the hook. In Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. From verse 6. And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bad Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. Now, here was a man that on his own he desired to hear the word of God. This is different from those who are not interested at all in the preaching of the gospel. This one knew that these were men sent of God to preach the gospel and he desired the preaching of that word. In verse 8, but Elimas, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. As the preachers, the apostles were preaching the gospel to the deputy, this, um, Sergio, uh, this sorcerer, who had been very, very close to the deputy. He will not want the deputy <coughs> to believe. And because of that, he sought to turn him away from the faith. What was Paul to do? In a situation like this, was he just to keep on preaching the word, just using the hook without any bait at all? From verse 9, then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost. I must repeat this again. What did he do after he became filled with the Holy Ghost? I think it will do you good to check up in the New Testament from Acts chapter 2 onwards to the epistles. What happens when a man is filled with the Holy Ghost? Uh, you know, because of the lack of understanding, the shallowness of understanding of many, many people, they feel that anytime you believe that you are full of the Holy Ghost, wherever it is, in the public, while you are preaching like this, in the prayer warriors team when you are praying or at the retreat wh whatever you are doing or at the miracle revival hour even when you are still preaching that suddenly you just feel that you are full of the holy ghost some people think that the thing to do immediately is leave the preaching leave every other thing they are doing and start speaking in tongues but it's not so and it reveals that we are not studying the Bible. Because you, you go through the Acts of the Apostles and you'll see they were full of the Holy Ghost. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. And then see what action followed. And the action that followed was not always just rattling on in tongues. And some of the tongues that the people speak, actually, to tell you the truth... I'll be ashamed to identify with those people publicly that were in the same church. Because I see it a lot of times. And he'll just repeat maybe the same word, the same word, the same word all the time. They'll jerk a little. Even people in, you know, people in our church in Nigeria, they'll jerk a little, put their head in a particular way. And once they have a particular feeling, maybe they're extra happy or something. 
and they feel that now they're full of the Holy Ghost and then they make that physical uh, jacket, then they begin to say, they say, banana, 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 banana. It's unreasonable. It has no meaning. Just the same word repeated over and over and over and over and over. Unreasonable. And I'll be ashamed to identify with them publicly to say that we are going to the same church. I'll be ashamed of it. But when you speak in tongues, it's real speaking. Real language. Not just the same word. Not just the same word over and over. And I've seen some of them. While they are praying, they'll be praying in English. Then they'll stop and say something. And then after that, they'll pray, you know, for five minutes. They'll then stop and say the same thing again. The same what they call speaking in tongues. Was that what they did in the New Testament? Why are we copying other people? If we don't have something, why don't you go and pray for the real thing? And so, here, he was full of the Holy Ghost. What then did he do when he was full of the Holy Ghost? He set his eyes on him. Think about a person full of the Holy Ghost, and then he stops the preaching, stops talking to the deputy, and starts looking at the man. Without saying a word, without speaking in tongues. Just looking at him for some time. No, no more preaching. The Holy Ghost that came on him made him silent, not made him speak. The Holy Ghost is not a robot. That every time he comes for 20, 30 years, he does exactly the same thing. He loves variety because he's a God of wisdom. Because he knows the thing that will fit this situation, fit this situation, fit this situation. And he just set his eyes on him. And then he opened his mouth. And you can tell by now he was full of the Holy Ghost and he was full of the gifts of the Holy Ghost. And whatever he said now, God confirmed it. But that's different from what some people do. And he said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, will thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind. Not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness. And he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. That's a miracle. I told them in Makodi. I must tell you. Many people misunderstand miracles. And I was preaching uh, at the crusade. And um, at Makodi it was another thing. But I told them that I believe in miracles. And I believe that many miracles will be happening there. Many miracles will be happening after we are finished there. That all those people that were there, you are a thief, you have been stealing before, now you are hearing this word of God. You don't repent. But they've never caught you. After this meeting, you go out to steal, a miracle will happen, they will catch you. And that you'll get to the prison. That that's a miracle. <laughs> and I told them that all you deeper life girls singing in that choir there, all you who have been going to deeper life Bible church in this town, you've been living in secret sin, going to commit adultery, fornication, and all these things, and you were not caught before, the next time you do it, you'll get a miracle, you'll become pregnant. <laughs> it's a miracle. People don't understand miracle. They think all, all the miracles that there are is just, you know, the lame walking, the blind seeing. But when that lady who has been hearing the word of God in the church, the word that is able to save, able to convert, and then she goes out, and then she commits that sin secretly, and then she becomes pregnant, and people know she's not married, and she cannot commit abortion, that is a miracle of judgment. 
And here was a miracle of judgment. It's not just uh, God give me butter, give me bread, sugar my tea, that they call miracle. That when that person, a holiness preacher, he goes out and, you know, commits sin, and he catches incurable gonorrhea, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. It's God working so that God will purify his church. When Ananias and Sapphira, when they died, what was it? It was a miracle. And yet, when Dorcas was raised up, it was also a miracle. The raising up of the dead for Dorcas was a miracle. The death of Ananias and Sapphira, also a miracle. Both glorified God. Because after the miracle of Ananias and Sapphira, none of the rest of the deceivers outside attempted to join the church only the people that were serious wanting to follow the lord actually came now to say we want to believe on the lord jesus christ now verse 12 when the deputy then the deputy when he saw what was done he believed and being astonished at the doctrine of the lord that miracle confirmed the word of God. The bait and the hook. And how many times we have been guilty of just throwing out the bait. Throwing out the bait without the hook. And the fish have eaten all the bait that you have. And yet they have not come into the net. The church has not grown. And yet we we'll prayed for the sick in our retreats, in our crusades, many, many things might have happened. And yet, why have they not been converted? Why are they not saved? Because we have not applied the word of God at the same time. It's not only the hook. It's not only the bait. It's not either or. It's both and. That is, both the hook and the bait. Let's end up with Mark chapter 16. From verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven, and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord walking with them, confirming the word with signs following. They preached the word. The miracles were to confirm the words they preached. Let's rise up and pray. Father, we thank you because you've given the hook. You are given the bait also. But you want us to use both wisely. As we have had your word. I'm so excited today because God has been so faithful to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. So I just thank God. Third year, the same thing. And I thank God because I'll be graduating in May. I didn't have 